Close your eyes for a moment and imagine the last time you heard an epic movie soundtrack thunder from a sound system, or the crisp chords of your favorite band echo through a home theater. Now consider that behind those seamless powerful acoustics lies a labyrinth of factories, specialized materials, and intricate processes, all dedicated to creating loudspeakers at an industrial scale. In a world dominated by sound, from the gentle hum of a smart assistant to the bass-heavy thump of a nightclub subwoofer, modern speaker production is a high-stakes dance of engineering, logistics, and global demand. Yet, for all their ubiquity, loudspeakers harbor surprising secrets, rare earth metals mined under contentious conditions, intense competition among top brands, and a constant tug-of-war between cost efficiency and pristine sound quality. Beyond the polished ads that promise immersive audio, or unparalleled fidelity, entire regions focus on manufacturing components so precise they're measured down to fractions of a millimeter. Workers handle delicate voice coils and fragile membranes that must withstand punishing decibels once installed in living rooms and concert halls. Industry insiders whisper about rumored shortcuts, questionable labor practices, and hush-hush deals securing scarce resources. Meanwhile, corporate giants strive to outdo one another unveiling bold designs that claim unmatched clarity, or forging behind-the-scenes alliances that leave smaller players fighting for survival. Is it merely the standard story of technological evolution and mass production? Or does the speaker business reflect a deeper tension between performance, profit, and ethics? It's a question that resonates not just with audiophiles, but with everyday listeners who connect their lives to music, entertainment, and communication. Indeed, the quest to mass-produce loudspeakers is an ongoing saga. One part scientific wizardry, one part big business, and one part cautionary tale about the hidden costs of feeding our insatiable appetite for sound. At their core, loudspeakers convert electrical signals into audible waves, a concept that dates back more than a century. Early devices were rudimentary at best, coarse paper cones, limited frequency response, and plenty of distortion. Over time, inventors and engineers refined these components, shaping new materials for diaphragms, magnets, and suspension systems. By the mid-20th century, as radio and television conquered households, the demand for more powerful, clearer speakers soared. Small workshops began scaling up, recruiting assembly lines to meet orders from TV manufacturers. Before long, competition sparked innovation. Better cones, improved coils, and more durable adhesives. The late 20th century saw the rise of corporate heavyweights who recognized the market potential. Brands like JBL, Bose, Sony, and others invested heavily in research facilities and global distribution networks. Warehouses transformed into fully automated factories that could pump out thousands of speakers daily. Some catered to consumer electronics, mass-producing affordable bookshelf units or car audio lines. Others aimed at the high-end niche combining advanced physics with handcrafted enclosures. But even so-called artisan brands discovered that meeting modern consumer demand required far more than a handful of skilled laborers. They needed robust supply chains, robotic assembly, and strategic partnerships to maintain a foothold in a market where bigger was often deemed better. On the surface, these expansions look like natural progress, evidence that technology was fulfilling our collective desire for better sound. Yet as the industry ballooned, new challenges emerged, often behind the scenes. With each merger, acquisition or factory upgrade, the pressure to secure cheaper raw materials and more efficient labor intensified. Certain regions became hubs for driver manufacturing, offering tax incentives and a ready workforce. Observers wondered whether rapid expansion was built on a precarious foundation of cost-cutting measures. Even so, the speaker giants marched forward, unveiling new lines at international expos, boasting about innovations that would push audio into the future. If the heart of a loudspeaker is its driver, then the magnet is its lifeblood. For decades, speakers relied on ferrite or Alnico magnets. But in the relentless push for more power and smaller packages, neodymium magnets became the gold standard. Highly sought after for their incredible magnetic strength, Neodymium-based magnets enable compact yet thunderously loud drivers. There's a catch, though. Neodymium is a rare earth metal, largely mined in specific regions, especially in parts of China. Extracting it can be environmentally harmful, 
producing toxic byproducts, and requiring significant energy. Communities near rare earth mines sometimes report health hazards and ecological damage, even as corporations tout these materials as essential for modern electronics. In parallel, polymer science and synthetic materials have reshaped speaker diaphragms, grills, and cabinets. Advanced plastics and resin composites promise lighter weight, higher rigidity, and a glossier finish. Factories churn out injection-molded parts with dizzying speed, but the feedstock for these processes often traces back to the petrochemical industry. Environmental advocates question the overall life cycle of a plastic speaker, from manufacturing emissions to disposal. Furthermore, the adhesives binding coils to cones contain chemical compounds that may release volatile organic compounds VOCs, in manufacturing plants with insufficient ventilation. Behind corporate headquarters, supply chain managers scramble to keep costs down. Contracts with magnet suppliers, chemical plants, and injection molding services must meet tight budgets, or else the final retail price creeps above what mainstream customers are willing to pay. Rumors swirl about how some manufacturers quietly source subpar magnet batches, just borderline strong enough to pass quality checks. Others keep an eye on emerging magnets, or even consider old-school ferrite for budget lines, worried that environmental or geopolitical shifts could disrupt the flow of rare earths. Consumers rarely see this tug of war, focusing instead on marketing claims of bigger sound in a smaller enclosure. Yet each incremental improvement can spark a resource scramble halfway across the planet. Labor also factors into the cost equation. Skilled workers are needed for certain delicate processes, but automation can slash expenses if a company invests in advanced machinery. The result is a balancing act. Too many robots might lead to layoffs, sparking local backlash. Too few, and your competitor's factory outperforms you in volume and consistency. Add to that the moral dimension. Factories in developing countries must often comply with labor regulations that can differ widely, and watchdogs question whether these rules are always enforced. Some major brands release corporate social responsibility reports highlighting worker training and safety standards, while critics remain unconvinced, pointing to the secrecy shrouding certain overseas operations. Perhaps nowhere is the tension between automation and human skill more evident than in the assembly of speaker drivers. Each driver features a cone, paper, polypropylene, or even exotic carbon fiber attached to a voice coil that vibrates in a magnetic gap. The tolerances are tight. Misalignments of even a fraction of a millimeter can lead to distortion or reduced efficiency. Historically, workers with steady hands would attach coils to cones using adhesives guided by jigs and test tones. Today, many factories rely on automated stations where robotic arms place components with near-perfect consistency. Proponents of full automation praise its repeatability, claiming it drastically reduces defects. Detractors, however, argue that not all materials behave identically. Two batches of paper pulp might vary in density or thickness, requiring subtle adjustments, better handled by an experienced technician. In certain high-end lines, companies still rely on partial hand assembly for final cone alignment, touting it as a premium feature that justifies a steeper price tag. Meanwhile, mass-market products aim for speed, with lines that can assemble and test thousands of drivers in a single shift. Large-scale facilities often cluster sub-assembly steps to maintain flow, one line might handle magnet bonding and spider gluing while the next station sets the cone, dust cap, and surround. Quality control checks might use lasers or cameras to ensure proper alignment, instantly rejecting any driver that falls outside strict tolerances. The pace is dizzying, conveyor belts never stop moving, and machines seldom rest. This approach keeps prices low, but some wonder if the relentless focus on throughput leaves minimal room for thorough inspection or nuanced craftsmanship. Beyond alignment, the material doping and layering can be equally crucial. Coating a paper cone with polymers can boost stiffness, while doping rubber surrounds might extend the speaker's lifespan. Factories jealously guard their recipes, sometimes forging quiet alliances with chemical suppliers to secure exclusive formulations. If a competitor stumbles across your doping technique, they might replicate its effects. This secrecy fuels speculation that certain big names in audio occasionally plant spies or recruit staff from rival labs. 
Such stories straddle the line between corporate espionage lore and genuine possibility. Either way, it underscores how competitive the speaker realm has become. A loudspeaker's driver is only part of the puzzle. Equally significant is the enclosure, or cabinet, that shapes how sound waves propagate. Traditional models favor wood composites like MDF, medium density fiberboard, or plywood for their acoustic properties and relative ease of shaping. Yet the push to mass produce at lower cost introduced plastics, which can be injection molded into sleek forms with minimal finishing. High end offerings might incorporate CNC milled aluminum or magnesium alloys, claiming superior rigidity. Each approach has trade offs wood can resonate, plastic may feel less premium and metal demands costly machining. Factories specializing in wooden enclosures often use automated saws and milling machines to cut sheets to precise dimensions. Then come assembly lines where panels are glued, braced, and clamped. Some outfits utilize robotic arms to handle the sanding and finishing, layering on paint or veneer with near-perfect uniformity. Others prefer hand-sanded surfaces, marketing a craftsman's touch to stand out in a market saturated with plastic shells. Rivalries erupt over which method yields the best sonic outcome, though the reality is far more nuanced. Different audiences have different expectations. Studio monitors demand neutral acoustics, while portable Bluetooth speakers prize lightweight resilience above all. Plastic enclosures move through injection molding machines, emerging with integrated brackets and mounts that reduce assembly time. Factories can mold thousands of identical shells in a single day, drastically cutting production costs. Critics, however, point to potential structural weaknesses, not to mention the environmental toll of producing, and later discarding, large plastic housings. Meanwhile, the metal route is popular for niche lines. Sleek, brushed aluminum cabinets that look impressive on a showroom floor. But forging metal enclosures at scale is no trivial feat. Welding, Bending and finishing metal can ratchet up overhead. That's why you'll often see these designs at premium price points, or only in certain product categories where brand image justifies the expense. Some rumors claim that a few well-known companies quietly outsource enclosure production to third-party factories known for using borderline quality materials. Because customers rarely open up their speakers to inspect internal bracing, it's easy for a brand to cut corners yet still charge a premium. On the flip side, other manufacturers take pride in their in-house approach, inviting journalists and dealers to tour spotless factories brimming with advanced CNC machines. The question remains, does the average consumer care about those behind-the-scenes details, or do they only look at brand reputation and design aesthetics? Once the drivers and enclosures merge, the resulting loudspeakers roll onward to testing stations. Each unit might endure a battery of diagnostics to confirm frequency response, distortion levels, and power handling. Some factories employ anechoic chambers, a specialized room designed to absorb orb reflections, where sensitive microphones capture real-time data. Automated software then compares these results to an ideal target curve, marking any outliers. If a speaker fails, it's either reworked, scrapped, or sold off as a factory second. Speed is paramount. With mass market lines, you can't spend hours fine-tuning each speaker. Instead, you rely on streamlined tests that highlight gross deviations. High-end brands often take a more hands-on approach, using advanced measurement tools or employing specialized technicians who can detect tonal anomalies. They might even match pairs to ensure both left and right channels have nearly identical response. Enthusiasts say this adds another level of quality. Mass producers, however, argue that modern automation is incredibly accurate and that for large volumes, a more comprehensive test on each unit would cripple the bottom line. The question of how stringent these tests are becomes a flashpoint. Insiders whisper that certain large-scale factories will relax tolerances during peak season, like major holiday shopping periods, just to keep shipments flowing on time. Official spokespeople deny such claims, asserting that every speaker meets published specs, but the rumors persist. Some workers at contract manufacturing plants describe ramp sprints, where multiple lines run non-stop around the clock to fulfill a massive retail order. Exhausted employees might skip minor steps or reduce final checks. As you'd expect, that can lead to an uptick in defective or inconsistent units. Buyers might notice subtle differences, 
one speaker sounding slightly muted compared to its mate. Whether these discrepancies become widespread enough to hurt a brand's reputation depends on factors as varied as distribution, marketing spin, and consumer tolerance. Just as in other industries, the speaker world features conglomerates swallowing smaller competitors in a bid to broaden market share. A massive brand might buy a specialty driver maker famous for handcrafted cones, or scoop up a boutique enclosure workshop known for gorgeous wood veneers. Some see this consolidation as an inevitable outcome of a fiercely competitive market. Others decry it as stifling innovation. Once a beloved indie brand is folded into a corporate portfolio, corners may be cut to boost profitability. Meanwhile, rumors swirl about hush-hush alliances formed to corner the supply of certain materials. Is a speaker conglomerate forging a private deal with a magnet manufacturer to lock out rivals? Are they quietly investing in polymer research labs to develop next-generation cone materials that remain proprietary for years to come? All of this speculation whips up anxiety in smaller manufacturers who lack the same financial muscle. In response, niche players often pivot to emphasizing authenticity, handmade products, local sourcing, or unique acoustic signatures that giant firms can't easily replicate. Yet the overshadowing controversies remain, reports of questionable labor conditions in offshore factories keep surfacing, especially those making budget-tier speakers sold under dozens of rebranded labels. Environmentalists call out the e-waste dilemma. As customers upgrade or discard old units, enormous heaps of plastic and electronics pile up in landfills worldwide. Then there's the glitz factor. Flashy marketing campaigns touting revolutionary breakthroughs that turn out to be incremental evolutions at best. It all adds up to a swirling environment where genuine advancements in acoustics jostle with hype-fueled claims, leaving consumers uncertain about whom to trust. Nevertheless, expansions proceed, fueled by soaring consumer demand for everything from home theaters to portable wireless models. For all the talk of performance and brand competition, an undercurrent of environmental concern permeates the audio industry. Each speaker embodies a cocktail of metal, plastic, adhesives and circuitry, most of which require specialized processes and resources to produce. Left unmanaged, manufacturing byproducts can pollute local air and water systems. Over time, as older models break or become obsolete, they add to electronic waste streams that are notoriously difficult to recycle. Sensing the public's shift toward more eco-friendly purchases, some manufacturers promote lines labeled green audio or tout packaging made from recycled materials. They might design enclosures to be more easily dismantled at end of life or swap out certain harmful chemicals for safer alternatives. Skeptics question the depth of these commitments. Is it genuine environmental stewardship or a marketing facade aimed at buyers hoping to align consumer habits with moral values? Further complicating matters are the advanced logistics behind global distribution. Speakers, particularly larger models, are bulky and heavy. Transporting them halfway around the world racks up carbon emissions, leading a few companies to consider localized production. The idea is that building speakers closer to key markets reduces shipping distances and fosters regional job growth. However, localized plants often struggle to match the operational scale of established factories which have spent decades refining their processes. So once again, cost versus sustainability sparks heated debate. Will consumers pay a premium for a speaker that genuinely treads lighter on the planet? Or does the quest for a bargain overshadow green aspirations? In some corners of the industry, engineers and entrepreneurs explore radical alternatives. Could we see biodegradable enclosures using hemp-based composites? Might 3D printed parts slash material waste? Or perhaps the future lies in modular speaker designs where individual components can be upgraded or replaced without tossing the entire unit. These concepts often stall at the prototype stage, overshadowed by mainstream companies pushing proven methods. Nonetheless, public pressure might eventually force real change, especially if stricter regulations on e-waste and resource extraction gain global traction. For now, the dream of truly sustainable audio remains a niche pursuit, overshadowed by the lure of mass production and the unstoppable tide of new product lines.